everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Michelle Leifer and I'm the director of the USDAN Institute for Animal Health Education at the Animal Medical Center. Thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar, uh, New Pet, Get Off to a Great Start with Dr. Heather Brauza. Thank you also to everyone who sent in questions ahead of time. We received so many great ones and we'll get to as many of those as possible. Um, and we also hope to have some time to answer questions via chat. Um, my colleague, Kimberly Young, will be keeping a close eye on the chat box, so please feel free to send along your questions. Um, and now I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Heather Brauza. Dr. Brauza obtained her bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia and received her doctorate in veterinary medicine from the Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine. In 2008, Dr. Brauza came to the Animal Medical Center and she's now the head of AMC's Community Practice Service. We're so grateful to have her with us to lead tonight's event. And without further ado, Dr. Heather Brauza. Hi, everybody. Um, so I thought that maybe we should start out by talking about what community practice is, because um, the name is not always uh, obvious in terms of what the service uh, provides. So uh, community practice, or CP as we call it affectionately in the hospital, is basically the Animal Medical Center's uh, primary care department. So we are the GPs uh, at the Animal Medical Center um, and provide uh, primarily wellness care. Um, we see pets for their annual to semi-annual visits, checkups. Um, we practice preventative medicine, so uh, helping people with their pets, um, in instructing them in regards to diet, dental care, weight, exercise, socialization recommendations, vaccinations. Um, we perform a lot of screening labs. Um, we provide basic surgical services like spays and neuters, uh, take off lumps and bumps, um, and manage chronic disease processes as well. Um, uh, what I enjoy most, I think, about being a general practitioner um, or a primary care doctor is the ability to, uh, one, uh, do a multitude of different uh, medical, or provide a multitude of different medical services to um, pets and clients, um, as well as the ability to uh, get to know my clients and, and patients for a number of years, so from the time they're uh, adopted or or obtained, um, I generally get to know know the uh, families and the pets uh, long term, which is is really nice. Um, I think one thing that is special about being a primary care vet at AMC is the ability to uh, work in a collaborative sort of environment with a bunch of terrific specialists and have access to the emergency services when indicated as well. So I think it allows us to provide really the, the highest standard of medical care to our patients because we can provide them access to specialists when needed. And it's kind of nice to be able to uh, sort of have case follow up and kind of keep everybody in house. Everybody's in the in the loop. So um, that's something I think is really nice for uh, patients in our practice at AMC. Oh, that's great. Um, well, we have a lot of questions for you, so we'll get started right away. Um, and I know everyone's situation is different. Um, most people have adopted, but other people are thinking of adopting. So we're just going to quickly address that. Um, basically, what are things that people should consider before becoming a new pet parent? Are there different considerations for adopting a new puppy or kitten versus an older animal? Um, well, I think that probably the biggest thing that people should uh, bear in mind when they're considering welcoming a new pet into their home is that they need to uh, be aware and realize that you're, you're really responsible for a, a lifelong commitment to that pet. Um, it's not something that should be taken lightly. You know, you're bringing a pet into your family and your home and it, you're, you're responsible for, for taking care of that animal for the entirety of their, of their lifetime. So I think that that's a, that's a basic but pretty important thing that I think some people don't realize. Um, 
you know, I think that um, you need to keep in mind uh, what your lifestyle is like, what your work schedule is like, because that might dictate um, what type of pet you would like to get, you know, cat versus dog, older dog versus puppy. Um, you know, every animal is going to have basic needs of exercise, food, shelter, attention, grooming, affection, um, socialization, training, um, but some some uh, ages or some breeds, some types of animals are going to require more or less of that, dependent on um, you know the age or the the breed of the of the animal. Um, I guess people should bear in mind that puppies and kittens are very cute, but they tend to be a bit more work than an older animal. Um, you know, they tend to be uh, little troublemakers. They're lucky they're cute because they require a lot of um, a lot of attention and. Uh, they're just a lot more work sometimes than um, an, an older animal. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, and I imagine or whether you have children, that's a consideration. And if you have another pet, um, you know, do you have any recommendations for introducing a pet to a, a home where there all, is already another pet? I think that um, uh, one, I think that you need to uh, kind of depends dog, cat, and who you're introducing to whom, um, but uh, you know, as slowly and gradually as you can make that introduction, I think the better. Um, I think you need to uh, probably have an inkling that uh, you would like to care for another pet and that your pet would enjoy or appreciate having a companion animal at home too. Um, when you are talking about uh, bringing in a, like another dog to a, a household per se, um, you know, there are some, there's probably a lot we could talk about on this topic, but you want to, you know, do introductions on neutral territory. You never want to leave anybody unsupervised until, you know, together until we're, you know, you're comfortable with uh, their interactions. Um, you know, cats are a little bit of a different story. Usually you want the new cat to be, um, you know, in a separate or isolated sort of area so they can, uh, just gradually be introduced to the resident cat um, if you're doing a cat to cat introduction. Um, and kids are a whole nother ball game. Um, kids, uh, probably the most important thing you can do um, when introducing pets to children is, is to make sure that the kids are uh, educated and prepped beforehand on what's acceptable behavior with a new pet. Um, and I think the trickiest part with kids is probably having the kid um, give the, that animal space um, and, and time to acclimate to their new environment because they're so, 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 so excited to have a new um, pet in the house that that can sometimes be challenging. Um, and the, probably the biggest thing uh, in terms of introducing pets to children is that they should, and every, we, I feel like most people know this, but it is good to reiterate, um, they should never, they should always be supervised, right? Um, animals are still animals um, and, and kids are still kids. So, um, you know, never leave a child unattended with a, with a pet. Very good, great, great advice. Mm -hmm. um, back to just acclimating and just getting your home ready. Um, can you talk a little bit about pet proofing a home? So pet proofing is basically just making sure that uh, your home is safe for your new uh, new dog, cat, puppy, kitten. Um, it's it's uh, making sure that small toys are picked up, electrical cords are out of the way, um, you know, puppies have safe rooms where they're confined and aren't going to chew things up. Um, it's basically uh, prote protecting them from themselves to a degree. Um, uh, it, it's a it's a good motivator to to clean up your apartment or your house. And definitely, definitely. I think it's there are things that you probably never do or there, and then the puppy or kitten will find right. Yeah. So sure. Yeah. Um, okay. Great. So um, let's talk a little bit about. This was an interesting question about um, adopting a special needs pet. Are there any, you know, tips or any considerations for that? Um, which is obviously you know, a wonderful thing to do. So, for sure. I mean, kudos for adopting a special needs pet. There are so many animals that need homes, um, and adopting with special needs is takes like an extra special person. Um, you know, in terms of uh, cats or dogs who can't see, um, they they 
do great, really. Um, it's shocking, I think, how well they are able to navigate and acclimate to uh, to life in a new space. Um, I think for blind animals in particular, uh, sort of the, the less moving around of furniture and things in your uh, home or apartment, the easier it is for them to get the lay of the land. Um, but their senses of smell, hearing, um, uh, et cetera, are, are, are just um, remarkable. Um, and they, they, they tend to do quite well. Um, you know, if you're talking about a dog who can't see, um, you know, if you're, when you're going out for walks and whatnot, obviously keeping them on a short lead um, so that they are uh, safe and feel, um, you know, secure out, out and about um, is important. But um, those guys do remarkably well. And great. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about the actual first vet visit. So what people should expect. Uh, so your first vet visit will probably entail your veterinarian trying to um, obtain as much of a medical history about the pet as possible. So um, I would always uh, encourage people to get your pet's medical records to your veterinarian um, either in advance of the appointment or at least the day of the appointment so they can review the records um, and see you know, what treatments um, or what medical history or vaccinations the pet has had so that they can be prepared to sort of help you and guide you as to what is um, necessary as far as medical care for the animal. Um, they will uh, you know, find out, uh, there's a list of relatively standard questions about how the pet's been doing at home, um, diet, preventatives, uh, like I said, vaccinations. Um, they'll perform a physical examination on your pet. So, um, you know, a nose to tail exam, um, as well as um, and then following up with any medical recommendations in regards to, you know, treatments or testing that they um, recommend based on the physical exam findings or previous medical records. Um, there's some standard testing that's typically done in new pets. Uh, fecal screening for intestinal parasites um, is, is pretty important. Um, there are also uh, infectious disease screenings, which are very common in uh, cats, like feline leukemia and FIV testing, uh, which is pretty typical and standard in new pets. Um, they will probably make a recommendation in regards to uh, preventatives for the pets. So that's pretty much what to expect. Okay, great. Um, and then it, can you talk a little bit about vaccines and what are the core vaccines for cats and dogs? Sure. Um, so in dogs, your core vaccinations are going to be rabies vaccine, um, as well as your uh, distemper, com distemper parvo combination vaccine, which is, uh, is infectious disease vaccination that uh, um, is effective against uh, distemper, adenovirus, parvovirus, and typically parainfluenza. Um, those are your two core dog vaccines. Um, your core kitty vaccines are going to be rabies as well, as well as uh, FERCP vaccine, which is uh, a, a vaccine that is protective against uh, Khaleesi virus, rhinotracheitis, and panleukopenia in cats. Um, so all of these diseases in both the dog and cat vaccines um, are, are potentially uh, life-threatening diseases. Um, hence, we recommend vaccinating against them. Right. Um, so now if you're adopting an older dog um, whose history may be a mystery, um, do you need to worry about over-vaccinating or what is the approach there? Um, you know, I think that um, vaccinations uh, are, are, are recommendations, I think, at least in our practice, are made on a very individual basis. Um, if you do not have a vaccine history on your uh, on the pet that you've adopted, um, you typically are going to uh, booster their core vaccinations um, so that we know that they're protected. The benefit of that outweighs the risk, I think. Um, uh, they don't need to get a full uh, like puppy series per se or kitten series per se, um, but they should get um, 
inoculated and then typically boosted a year later. Um, that's in terms of core vaccinations. There are other vaccines, more for uh, dogs um, or cats that are going outdoors that would be considered probably like non-core vaccines and those are going to be lifestyle dependent. So if your newly adopted dog or cat um, kind of fit the criteria to, uh, to warrant those vaccines, then those would be administered as well. Great. Okay. Um, now, this is a question or topic that I know a lot of people um, have a lot of questions about um, is nutrition and food. And with there are so many different types of pet food out there, even within the same brand, what should pet owners know about pet nutrition? Um, pet nutrition is a, a, a big topic. Um, and I guess I would say probably the most important thing I could tell pet owners is to make sure you're feeding your dog or cat a, a balanced diet. Um, so um, home cooking is fine as long as you are using a recipe that is formulated by a veterinary nutritionist if you are inclined to go the home cooking route. Um, otherwise, I would recommend feeding a, a commercial dog or cat food, um, preferably one that uh, is formulated by a company that has veterinary nutritionists on staff and has perhaps completed some uh, feeding trials to make sure that animals do well on those diets. Um, you know, uh, there is no one best food. Um, there's a lot of good marketing in the pet food world. Um, and I think people are often influenced by that. Um, and I don't know that a lot of it has any medical basis. Um, I guess I, one thing that I would say that has become an issue in the last couple of years um, is that it has uh, come to the attention of like the FDA that um, it seems like there may be a, a, a risk associated with feeding um, what we call bag diets, which are boutique exotic grain free diets um, and development of a heart disease in dogs called dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, and there, there are studies currently going on because we don't really know what the underlying problem is with this type of diet. Um, but I generally will tell my clients at this point, based on what we know, I probably would steer clear of feeding diets that fall into those categories and uh, feed something that's more of a, a, a traditional uh, food. I guess the only other thing I would add is that um, I'm generally not a, a big proponent of raw food diets, and that is primarily because of the risk of contamination um, for both uh, the pets and people. Um, so there are some big raw food supporters, but I think that, um, you know, I, I just am not comfortable with the risk of salmonella and E. coli that comes along with feeding those diets. Um, especially for anyone who's immunocompromised, has children, um, or just doesn't want to get sick. Animals can get sick from those uh, organisms as well. So um, I guess that's the only thing I would, other thing I did. Great. Yeah. Um, what about, you know, there are veterinary diets within these different brands? Um, you know, do you recommend those? I guess does it it's maybe depends on the situation? Sure. The yeah, I think that... Um, you know, I think by and large, uh, animals that are normal and healthy don't need to be on a prescription diet. Um, but I think that there, there are certain underlying uh, medical conditions um, that, that, uh, that benefit from being on prescription diets. And a lot of research um, has gone into these foods uh, to, to uh, basically ensure that they are effective um, at uh, typically uh, improving quality of life and longevity for pets um, who eat those foods. Um, so there are a multitude of prescription diets from animals with kidney disease to animals with certain types of GI disorders to animals that are very predisposed to dental disease. So, um, you know, there, there's been a, a lot of research done in that area, and I think that they are definitely beneficial to animals who uh, have the underlying medical conditions that would benefit from them. Great, great. Um, and now my next question you kind of hinted at is just the idea of um, keeping your pet at a healthy weight. Can you speak a little bit about that? Because I know it's, a, it's actually a pretty big problem, um, sure. obesity. Yeah, I mean, obesity is a problem for 
humans in the United States as well as animals in the United States. Um, COVID-19 has not helped with uh, anybody's mm. weight management probably. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that uh, one thing that's important to remember is that, um, you know, treats are not equivalent to love. So sometimes we're, you know, treating our animals over and over and over because, you know, every, every dog's going to be happy to get treats to cats too. Um, but we need to remember that, um, you know, it's everything in moderation. Uh, I think that the, the main source of calories for a dog and cat should be their food. Um, and treats are, they should be used as rewards for training or for when they are going to be left alone or, um, you know, for, kind of special special occasions. Um, they're, they're no longer treats if they're getting them all the time. So um, I think moderation is key. Um, and we also have to keep in mind that, you know, how much food and how much they are getting in the way of treats um, is also gonna vary dependent on, um, you know, their exercise regimen, how, you know, how long are they out and about walking? Are they racing around in the dog park? Um, or are they sitting on a couch all day? Um, as well as the fact that every dog or cat, just like every human has, um, you know, a, a different metabolism. So some cats seem to put on weight by, you know, breathing air. Um, and, and others, you know, can, uh, can eat a bunch of treats and be fine. Um, so I think there's a lot of individual variation as well. Uh, well, as long as you brought up the pandemic and quarantine with food, I know that that definitely is a, a big issue. Um, and I, you know, you worry about getting, you know, a dog becoming deconditioned and then trying to get back into it. The same thing with us, right? The same, you know, trying to get back and exercise. My dog, you know, for instance, would we used to go to the dog park every day for an hour and now this is obviously not possible we walk but he's definitely you know put on weight and we try hard to get it off but i'm also just worried because he's getting older and you know with arthritis and so basically just you know i mean it's it's hard right at, at this time but just i guess being being mindful of it measuring food and like you said food shouldn't be love you know get some other rewards but Maybe you could also, yeah, just talk a little bit about just the idea of our deconditioning and reconditioning. Yeah. Um. Uh, sure. Yes. I, I guess I probably should have mentioned with the food that I think it's uh, relatively important that you measure out how much. Yeah. <laughs> Seems obvious, right? But yeah. we don't always do. Um, yeah. But in that way, one, you you are you have a very objective way to measure how much they're getting in the way of food and calories. Um, you can tell if they're uh, eating less than normal or uh, you know, wolfing down, um, everything, um, which they probably should be if they're getting the right amount of food. Um, and if you're a veterinarian or you, or you notice that your animal is gaining weight, that you can, you have an objective amount to cut back from. So typically I'll tell clients in order to get your dog or cat to lose weight, you need to reduce their caloric intake by probably about 25 to 30%, um, to achieve weight loss. And obviously in increasing their activity level is going to help facilitate that. Um, in, in terms of, uh, uh, I think you're asking about like, uh, once quarantine, quarantine is over and people are Someday. Really to work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's slowly happening. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it is going to be, it'll be a transition, I think for everybody. Um, you know, pets are, very much creatures of habit. So I think um, a lot of dogs have um, been thrilled to have their families home <laughs> all day, every day. Cats, maybe some, some less so. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I think that, um, uh, and I think, uh, you know, trying to to make sure that even though everybody's home all the time, that, that uh, your pets are getting some time alone um, is, pretty important because there's going to be, you know, otherwise they're in for a, a shock when all of a sudden they're left alone, whether they're a puppy or an adult dog. So, um, you know, finding ways to have them have alone time um, is, is pretty important. Um, otherwise, we're, we are going to have a bunch of animals that have severe separation anxiety issues. Even if it's just a few minutes, right? Go down the hallway just to... Yeah. And I think, I... yeah, it's the, it's the appropriate thing to do, like when you're 
train like training a new puppy or or uh, a, a new pet is you know gr giving them a, a, a safe area where they have um you know a place to rest and comfy space and potentially um you know maybe some uh, uh n background noise like white noise um uh something to occupy their time food puzzles toys things like that um and uh and, and letting them gradually build up to their time alone um for dogs and cats really um there's a uh, synthetic pheromone um, called the uh, the brand is uh, Adaptil, um, and uh, they make a, a diffuser that can be somewhat helpful for puppies and dogs in terms of calming uh, pheromones. Uh, Feel away would be the cat version of that, which um, well, has been around uh, a long time for and has been beneficial for um, cats with um, certain behavioral issues or um, anxiety issues. That's great. Um, I think with the weight, not so harp on that, but I think it, it's very easy when we're we're seeing them every day not to realize, right, that maybe they're putting on weight because we see them as beautiful and wonderful. And so I, maybe a scale is, you know, weigh them, right? Like, yep. and so that's, so I think a good, good thing just for everyone. Um, because the obesity, can you talk a little bit about that, just the dangers of, of that? Sure. So we know obesity is a is a huge medical issue in people, and I, once again, the same thing holds true in in animals. Um, you know, being significantly overweight, uh, it decreases longevity, decreases lifespan. Um, it puts more stress on uh, joints. It is so it's uh, causes orthopedic issues or contributes to orthopedic decline. Um, it's a stress on your cardiovascular system um, and it causes like sy really systemic inflammation as well. Um, obesity is, uh, you know, even more profound, I think, in certain breeds of uh, of dogs, even cats. Um, so uh, brachycephalic or smush faced animals like bulldogs, pugs, um, those guys um, are, are even uh, higher risk for respiratory issues um, when they're overweight. Um, same with uh, long back dogs like uh, dachshunds, basset hounds, obesity is a risk factor for, um, you know, disc disease in, in those type of breeds. Um, so, uh, being, being obese is, is, uh, not, not healthy for anyone. Um, then there's underlying medical conditions, like, uh, anything that's respiratory, like from collapsing trachea on that, that, uh, is negatively impacted by being overweight. There's really nothing good about it. <laughs> no, no. Right. Um, I know that another um, important topic is teeth and dental and just this is something I imagine that it would be good to get your pet in the habit of early on. So maybe if you could talk a little bit about just the importance of caring for a pet's teeth and how, how to do it. Yeah. Sure. Um, so yes, uh, prophylactic dental care is, um, is super important in animals um, as far as uh, what you can do at home. Um, the best thing you can do by far and away is to get your pet acclimated to daily tooth brushing. Um, you can do this with, you want to use a dog ear kitty toothpaste um, and either a finger brush that goes on the end of your index finger um, or using a small like child's toothbrush. Um, and it's a work in progress, you know. Most cats and dogs are are not accustomed to having their uh, mouths messed with and their their teeth brushed. Um, so you know, you, you need to start slowly. Um, and there are uh, there are educational videos and whatnot on how how to how to do it. But if you can brush your pet's teeth once a day, um, that is truly the best thing you can do as far as prophylactic dental care. Um, there are all sorts of dental diets and treats and things along those lines. I usually send people um, to a website um, from the Veterinary Oral Health Council called vohc.org um, and the products that are listed on that site because there are just so many um, out, uh, available. Um, the 
the uh, companies that that uh, have their products listed have sh have demonstrated that their products are um, effective at uh, reducing plaque and tartar. Um, so that's a, a a place to look if you're looking for um, dental or de veterinary dental products as well. Um, and then your your pet, just like we need cleaning at the dentist, um, you know, twice a year. I think most animals don't. I have dentistries done that often because they need to be put under anesthesia to have a, a proper dental done. Um, but, uh, you know, dis, dis, even if you're brushing your pet's teeth every single day, eventually they will need their, their teeth cleaned. Um, you know, the more you can do at home, uh, potentially the less often you, you need to do that. Great. Um, and then if you could speak a little bit about trimming your dog's nails, different things that you could get them used to when they're young. Um, the nails are, can be tough, right? Yeah, um, just like dogs don't uh, inherently like their mouths messed with, I think touching feet is probably even a bigger <laughs> issue for some animals if they're not accustomed to it. Um, and it's really, uh, I think, a function of um, desensitizing them to being handled. Um, you know, when we talk about new puppies and kittens and things, you know, um, and, and on that topic, um, that's part of what we recommend in, in all new pets is getting them accustomed to touching their feet, squeezing their paws. Um, and that's in preparation for nail trimming throughout their lives, if you can get them accustomed to it. Uh, when they're malleable little puppies and kittens, it'll make life easier for everyone involved as they get older. Um, if you have an older animal who's not yet accustomed to nail clipping, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a gradual, slow process depending on the animal. You know, you, you start by slowly introducing them just to gently touching their paws. Um, and gently, you know, squeezing their paws and just having the nail clippers out. Um, you know, uh, food is your friend in these particular cases. So, um, you know, extra special delicious things for when they're calm and relaxed being handled like that um, is, a, is a good way to positively reinforce that behavior. Um, I'll, easier if you have more than one person um, attempting these, per, you know, these type of things, because then you have one person to feed and one person to desensitize. So um, you may end up only, you know, clipping one nail and, and that's it. So um, it can take a long time to get them accustomed to it if they're not already, but it, it can be done. <laughs> now that's, that's a good tip of the one at a time. You don't have to do them all at once, right? If you, if it's too much like my dog, I can get one and then he'll run away, you know? So yeah, do the slow process, but get it done. Um, and one thing I know we definitely should do is microchipping. So if you could talk a little bit about that, because I think some people assume it's more like a GPS, which it's yeah. not. And yeah, so just a little touch on that, just the importance of it. Sure. Um, and that might happen someday. That would be kind of yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think but, they have collars like that, you yes. know, but yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a microchip is a tiny little device that's about the size of a grain of rice that is implanted um, by a, an, an injector, um, like a needle underneath the skin. Um, and it basically contains uh, a number uh, that can be retrieved by scanning. Um, the hope of microchipping is that if your pet is uh, ever lost and they are picked up um, and brought to a veterinarian or a shelter or something along those lines, that, that uh, they would be scanned. Um, and then that, that uh, number could be retrieved and would ultimately lead, uh, lead back to you. So you could get your, get your pet back. Um, the, that's <clears throat> probably the most important thing with microchipping to remember is that if you ever change your information, you really need to update the yeah. microchip info um, with the company you're registered with because otherwise it's not helpful. That's so important. Yeah, I, yeah people don't sure. register because they think it, there's like a one general database, which there's yeah. not. So yeah, no, that's, that's really important. Yeah. Um, let's see. So uh, we're getting near then, and then we can take some of your questions. Um, Kimberly, 
Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kimberly, and I'm the Education and Events Associate um, for the Stan Institute for Animal Health Education. Um, and so uh, now we have an opportunity to say, take some questions in the live chat. Um, so if you had any questions that you wanted to ask, um, you can type it into the chat. Um, and I see that some people have already begun um, submitting questions. So um, Dr. Browser, I know we touched on this before when it came to introducing, um, you know, a new animal into the house. Um, one of the participants in the live chat happens to have a cranky cat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and they are getting a small rescue dog, not a puppy, but a small rescue dog. Um, and their, their cranky cat is known to bite and scratch. Um, do you have any tips or recommendations for making something like that work? Um, well, I guess uh, probably the most important thing is to uh, ensure that the resident cat feels safe and secure in their environment. So. Um, cats need to general, even if there isn't a dog, um, they should have places to get up and away. Um, they like to be high up and kind of survey their kingdom. Um, they feel secure on, uh, up in, uh, cat trees. Cat furniture, I think, is helpful. Um, I think probably, uh, you know, having that dog, uh, having an area where that dog cannot get to the cat if the cat doesn't want to be near the dog is helpful. Um, so the cat should have like a safe haven and a safe space to, to uh, keep away from that dog. Um, once again, I, I guess I mentioned it earlier that they should be, for sure, they should be kept uh, separate when the, um, you know, when their family's not at home to kind of supervise interactions. I think with initial introductions and stuff, it's probably best done um, with the dog uh, potentially on a leash um, or through a baby gate um, because uh, you want the cat to be able to sort of uh, initiate things. Um, we don't know how the dog's going to act with the cat. Um, this is an instance where uh, feel away is not going to hurt anything, which is that synthetic kitty cat pheromone. Um, they make diffusers um, that can be helpful. So um, I wouldn't say it's, uh, it's impossible, but um, you need to kind of make the, make the cats in, the cats environment as, um, as, as good as it can be, basically, um, and ensure that the dog is not harassing the cat and vice versa. All right, wonderful. That's some great advice. Um, so we had two other questions um, as they are related to um, vaccinations. Um, so I'll sort of ask this in two parts, but um, would you be able to first explain um, what is the yearly titer test um, for animals? Um, so there is, uh, there are a couple, couple infectious diseases that we vaccinate against um, that can be titered. So a titer is a blood test, which basically um, the goal of which is to uh, assess if an animal has an antibody level high enough to protect them against contracting this infectious disease. So the two that are most commonly titered um, in dogs would be uh, distemper virus and parvovirus. Um, so, uh, some people will choose to titer their animals in lieu of vaccinating them. Um, and, uh, basically, uh, if the titer is, is adequate, it would be presumed that you don't need to then boost or vaccinate that dog. Um, they're often performed on an annual basis, um, because you just don't know when titers are going to decline in terms of their protection. Um, when we are vaccinating an animal uh, against those two particular uh, diseases, uh, the, we, we generally follow the American Association of Animal Hospital guidelines. Um, in adult dogs, those, the, uh, the distemper parvo combination vaccine that we spoke of like kind of in the beginning of this talk um, is uh, generally given every three years. Um, so if you vaccinate a dog, uh, you don't necessarily need to eat, titer them every year. Uh, you would just conceivably booster the vaccine in three years or three years from that vaccine, you could consider titering them to see if they require an additional booster. Gotcha. So with the yearly titer and then booster vaccines every, every three years. 
Um, so in that in that case, um, I mean, somebody else had a, a question about the need for annual vaccinations or boosters when humans don't. Um, could you explain a little bit about why some of these vaccinations might take place every three years, whereas for, for people, we might not see that um, happening as often? Um, sure. I think it depends on, there, there are certain diseases that uh, vaccines will be protective for longer durations than others. Um, so there are uh, really only a handful of um, uh, vaccinations that are administered on an annual basis. Um, and so for dogs, those would be leptospirosis vaccine, Lyme vaccine, um, and Bordetella vaccine. Um, the uh, rabies vaccine and distemper parvo vaccine are generally, um, like I said, given less frequently. Rabies vaccines are licensed for three years. Um, and so that becomes a little bit of a, of a legal issue. Um, so um, truth be told, we don't know the exact duration of immunity um, that these, that, you know, because there's, there's individual variation. Um, so they're, they're uh, required to be boosted at certain intervals um, because that's generally going to protect everybody. You know, but if you, you know, titer the dog, five years after their distemper parvo vaccine was last given, they may have a protective titer. One dog may, um, another dog may not. So three years at this point in time seems to be the recommendation um, in accordance with like AHA guidelines. Got it, okay. Um, so moving away from vaccinations um, for a bit, um, we had somebody who is asking, so they have taken in or rescued um, a cat that was abused um, and won't come, go anywhere near the owner, lives on the back of the couch, um, doesn't know how to play. Um, is there anything that you might suggest that this owner can do to help the cat that they've rescued? Um, sure. I think that, um, good for you for rescuing this cat. Um, uh, and I think that, um, you know, every cat and dog, just like every person has a different personality. Um, it's a huge transit, uh, transitional period when an animal enters a new home with, uh, you know, a whole, it, it, it's a whole new environment. It's a whole new world. Um, so it can often take a long, long time, um, particularly if they had a negative experience in the past to acclimate to being in a loving home. Um, you know, things that may be helpful are to, you know, give the cat space and do everything slowly and gradually. Um, but you can acclimate the cat to, you know, just, uh, you know, giving, you know, your feeding meals, um, this is when, once again, treats are helpful, um, you know, and then you can uh, play time, social interaction time, even if you're not touching the cat. Um, a lot of cats will enjoy, um, like, prey-driven play. So um, there are cat dancers and cat fishing poles and all sorts of um, different toys that might get that cat some activity and exercise and help them come out of their shell a little bit. Um, once again, giving the cat a safe spot to be up and away and just kind of survey things is helpful and can reduce some of the stress and anxiety for the cat. Um, uh, as well as, well, once again, feel away diffusers are not going to hurt. <laughs> um, so um, I, they can be helpful for some stressed out kitty cats. I think that's really important advice to just the fact that all animals are different and just because you know, if you had one cat that behaved one way, I think people try to be like, why won't my cat be like this one? But, you know, it's it's an adjustment period and I think you have to appreciate the differences and, you know, over time, I think they'll adjust and, you know, but it, it does take time, right? I, I see the, um, someone else was writing, I think about their um, FIV positive cat that, um, that scratches and won't cuddle with her and her old cat used to cuddle. So, you know, I think it's, it's hard, right? But just, it sometimes takes time and sometimes the, you know, one cat won't be yeah. like your old cat. Yeah. And just, they're all different, which is why we love them <laughs> and appreciate. <laughs> you have to find other, you know, other ways to interact and 
and uh, you know enjoy your time with that particular animal. So that might be more like interactive play, you know, or um, and and it may be that uh, you know cats um, and dogs um, they have a threshold, right? So um, you need to be like mindful and kind of respectful of that, um, you know. No, nope, even pe people do too, right? No, nope. <laughs> you know, some people are touchy people and some people are not. Um, and, and some animals, particularly cats and, and dogs really, um, are the same way. So um, you can definitely, uh, I think, um, get them more accustomed to handling and petting, but you have to respect their boundaries. Um, and some, some cats and dogs are just not gonna be s snuggly, cuddly lap pets and, and, and some are. So, um, you know, it's sl slowly, slowly, you can, um, you know, try to introduce them to that, but you need to be mindful that um, if that's not their thing, it's, it's not their thing. So you can, you, you'll, um, but you can find other ways to interact with them and, and have a, a positive relationship. To step away from behavior for a little bit, we have another question related to food. Um, I know we talked quite a bit um, about keeping your, health at a pet, uh, keeping your pet at a healthy weight um, and about different types of food. So this question is about kibble versus wet food. Um, you know, is, is it important to feed both? Um, in particular, this person is fostering um, an animal that has lost a few teeth um, and they've been adding water to the dry food. You know, is that okay? Um, what are your thoughts? Um, sure. I think uh, depends on the animal. I think that um, uh, cats in particular um, should uh, receive canned food um, or uh, some type of moistened diet um, or uh, and be exposed to a variety of things if, if possible when they're young because they can develop some pretty um, significant food preferences that will prevent you from being able to change their diet when they're older. And sometimes for medical reasons, we end up needing to um, put those cats or would prefer that, that some cats be on canned food diets, um, cats that have a propensity to form uh, urinary stones or have renal disease. Um, you know, there are certain disease processes that, that animals um, do better on canned diets. So, um, uh, so introducing those foods, um, particularly, particularly to cats, um, is, is kind of important. Um, kibble versus wet food. Otherwise, um, you know, there's a, there is a, um, a bit of a, a crunch factor in kibble that can be a little bit helpful in terms of, um, dental care for animals. So if you have a large enough kibble, um, they can sometimes be a little bit abrasive on the teeth. Um, and so, uh, are helpful in animals that are predisposed to dental disease. Um, that being said, both kibble, uh, both animals that eat kibble and wet food will build up uh, plaque and tartar on their teeth if their teeth are not being attended to on a pretty regular basis. Uh, wet food probably builds up faster. Um, if you do have an animal that has, um, you know, dental disease or is missing teeth such that kibble is difficult for them to eat or they can't chew it, then by all means, um, you know, wet food is probably preferable or soaking the kibble like overnight so that it's soft and e easily eaten um, is, is totally fine. Can you speak a little bit about um, toys and bones um, for dogs and fracturing teeth? Um, sure. How do you know, you know what, what is safe? So, I guess you should, you can use the rule of thumb that if anything that would fracture your teeth will, has the potential to fracture a dog's teeth, um, you know, which, which um, makes it a little tricky, right? Dogs by nature are chewers um, and they should be provided things to chew. Uh, but you just don't want to use things like um, real bones or some toys that are really rock hard because you do run the risk of of fracturing teeth. Um, obviously you always want to um, make sure that if you are giving things that are um, softer, uh, you do so with under supervision, right? Because you don't want them to bite off chunks of anything and swallow them um, because then you can end up with uh, small intestinal foreign bodies and problems along those lines. So, um, 
sometimes like the harder rubber toys like Kongs um, filled with yummy stuff um, are, are decent chew toys. Um, but uh, you, don't, you don't want to give things that are super, super hard because there is the potential for fractures. Definitely, yeah, that's good advice. Um, I think uh, Dr. Ford from AMC's Dentistry, uh, we, he did a lecture with us and he calls it like the rule of thumb, thumbnail. And it's like, if you can't dent a, a toy with your nail, then it's probably too hard. So, right, so yeah, pretty good advice, yeah. And if you guys would like to watch the um, lecture on dentistry, we do have that on our, our YouTube page. It's <laughs> <So. laughs> good. So we have um, one um, sort of question comment um, about somebody who's recently um, adopted a four-year-old unneutered Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, um, who was going to be spayed shortly, um, but is not reliable going to the bathroom. The dog goes to it to the bathroom inside the house at least once a week. They tried wee wee pads. The dog slept on it. <laughs> um, do you have any advice um, house training an animal at an older age? Uh, well, sure. I think that um, schedule and routine is very helpful. Um, dogs are very much creatures of habit. Um, so they are uh, they're, they're comfortable, um, with, with routine and that can be helpful in terms of elimination, um, uh, as, as well as like just a generally happy pet, um, confining that dog to a small area. Um, it's kind of the idea behind crate training, um, in puppies or older dogs. If the dog is, um, comfortable in a, tr a crate or a small space, um, that's probably where I would have the dog when they're not being directly supervised. And once they leave that space, they should be taken um, outside. Typically, if you're having a house training problem and you're sure that, and I mean, you've discussed it with your vet and there's no underlying medical problem, um, then uh, you need to kind of make their world smaller, right? Confine them to, a, they shouldn't have like the whole run of your house or apartment. They should be confined to a small space um, or a crate when they're not being directly supervised. Um, and then when they're removed from that space, they should be um, taken outside to go to the bathroom. Um, if you're, t I'm not sure if you're talking about urinary or, or, uh, or fecal accidents, but um, dogs are often inclined to uh, poop after they eat. So um, walking uh, after, after they eat can help with elimination issues too. Getting the dog on a, a schedule um, is very helpful. Um, and then obviously confining them to a smaller area where they don't want to pee or poop, right? No dog really uh, wants to be in an area where they're voiding um, is is helpful too, and then taking them out immediately after that. Sometimes people also tether the animal, um, meaning like have a, uh, when you're home, um, to uh, either to them or to a, it's the same idea is that they're in a small area or they only have a limited range. So they're less inclined to go to the bathroom where they're gonna be hanging out. Thank you so much, Dr. Brauza, and thank you to everyone for joining us. This was really wonderful and so much great information. I know it's a, a difficult time for everyone, and we really, really appreciate you joining us and trusting us, and we're going to continue, continue to do more events, and we'd love to hear from you. If there are any topics you'd like covered, um, please get in touch with us, um, and we look forward to seeing you soon, okay? Take care, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye-bye.